and welcome to another episode of Ubar. Today I want to make like a summary video of all the different storage solutions that Lambda offers so you know how to choose the right one for your use case. So a few weeks ago, Lambda announced that they will increment their ephemeral storage from half a giga to 10 gigas. And now we have quite an interesting uh, set of different options to uh, store our data. So if you're not aware of which options we are talking about is uh, S3, then we have uh, temporary storage, then uh, EFS, and then Lambda layers. I know, Lambda layers sounds weird, eh? but wait with me. So in this video, I want to go through each of these options and share with you what they are, how they integrate with Lambda, and also some good use cases for them. And then in the description box, you will find videos on how to implement each of these storage solutions in your own projects with infrastructure as code. If you are missing something or you want to learn more, just let me know in the comments and I can create more content around this topic. So let's get started. So let's start with Amazon S3. S3 and Lambda are like such a great combination. The integration in the operational side is extremely great, as well as how the service communicates together between the two of them. If you don't know S3, S3 is the object store for AWS. It stands for Simple Storage Service and is one of the oldest services out there. It's also one of the first serverless services. So basically it adheres to every serverless thing that you can imagine. You pay as much as you use, high availability, um, no infrastructure to manage and it scales automatically. So great. And because of that, Amazon Lambda and S3 really work together. So you can have as many functions requiring from S3 as you can, and S3 will scale accordingly to that need. So you don't need to worry about connections or storage or anything. On the communication side, also the connection between S3 and Lambda is bi-directional, and this is pretty cool. Not only you can store and read and manipulate data from S3 from your Lambda function, but also elements and, and, and events happening in S3 can trigger Lambda functions. So that's, this makes it a very interesting and, and a new approach on how we do traditional computing. Uh, this was not possible before, but now basically an object is created in S3, a Lambda can get triggered, an object is modified in S3, a Lambda can get triggered, an uh, object is deleted in S3, and then <laughs> that happens. So. This is super powerful and it opens a lot of possibilities. And this is a super amazing integration that all the serverless developers are taking advantage of. Also, when we talk about communications, the communication is extremely simple. You don't need to put your Lambda in a VPC as S3 doesn't require one. Like Lambda, they work uh, in the default Amazon VPC, so you don't need to worry about that. So the connection happens through uh, AWS SDK and also natively from the infrastructure. In order to secure your connection, you need to give permissions uh, Lambda to access the bucket and the bucket to invoke the Lambda if that's the case. Another benefit of S3 and Lambda together is that the content can change dynamically. This means that you can share the content from many Lambda functions, many applications, and they can all change the content of that buckets and that uh, share uh, objects. And then the Lambda will get those as they come without need to redeploy. And this is something that we love from S3. However, uh, S3 is not a file system, so it's not there for manipulating files. It's just an object store. So that comes with a lot of limitations. Also, while we think that uh, S3 might have a file kind of path, no, when we look at folders, uh, those are just prefixes in the object's um, key. So that's something to have in mind. It works a little different than a file system, so you can uh, work with the objects, but not in the way that you will work with files. And also the speed of retrieving objects from S3 is fast, but there's um, ways that I will show you today that are faster. So when you work with S3, sometimes retrieving very large objects can take a lot of time and that can be kind of uh, a lot of wasted time that your Lambda is executing. So what are good use cases for Lambda and S3 together? Well, data lakes, Basically, you can have multiple Lambda functions, multiple applications, all consuming and doing things with the same shared data. That's an amazing use case. 
Also, when you have to share data, not in the form of a data lake, but just to share data between different functions. For example, uh, one function is um, transcribing a video and putting the transcription in the, in the bucket. And then the next function is picking that up and uh, doing, I don't know, subtitles. And then the next function is grabbing the first video and the subtitles and putting them together for example, or translating them so you can uh, connect the, the data from one function to another. And also when you need to share uh, objects between multiple applications, S3 has this security mechanism called access points that allows you to have different access permissions for different applications. And this is amazing when you're working with uh, shared data, so you don't need to duplicate the data all around. You can just keep it in one place and then multiple applications can access that. So for example, if you have uh, all your video repositories in one bucket, then uh, one application with functions can come and grab that data to, I don't know, populate your, I don't know, video player app. Another one can take the video data and extract the metadata. Another application can come and, I don't know, make the transcription, translation, and add the subtitles. So you can use multiple applications and, and connect them to S3 amazingly easy. Also, S3 is great for huge files because you pay as much as you need and you can upload very big files there. However, you will need to transfer those to the functions and have that in mind. And sometimes you might need to process those in the functions. So you might need to have ephemeral storage that we'll talk about that later. And also one use case that I think I mentioned before that you can attach uh, Lambda functions to the life cycle of the objects when the objects are removed, deleted or modified. And these add another layer of complexity and interest to our serverless applications. Now let's move to ephemeral storage. So ephemeral storage is that storage capability that is inside the uh, execution environment of your Lambda functions. So until a few weeks, we have 512 megabytes. Now we can configure that up to 10 gigas. Again, this is configurable. If you don't do it, if you don't change it, then um, you will stay <laughs> in half a gig, but that's, uh, it's okay. We don't need it all the time to have that much uh, space. So when you deploy a function, you set the amount of ephemeral storage that you will have available. So uh, that space, it, it cannot be changed on the fly. You need to redeploy the function in order for that to take place. Also, the storage is not shared between functions. So you cannot share uh, whatever you download in one function into another one. And when we talk about different invocations, you might be able to share uh, what is in the female storage, but there is a big bad. <laughs> Lambda will preserve the female storage between the warm Lambda. So your uh, Lambda starts um, executing. It's called start, it's start, now it's warm. It, you download whatever you need into the temporary storage and you might have multiple invocations on that uh, execution environment while the Lambda is warm. And then uh, when the Lambda uh, environment is deleted, whatever is in the temporary storage gets deleted as well. So you cannot trust that there is something in there uh, when the Lambda starts executing. So that's something you have to have in mind. The integration between Lambda and the female storage is native. It's like uh, working with your own hard drive. You have the fastest connection to the files there because it's inside the same machine. It's everything uh, like if you were working in, in local. So that's amazing. So if you need to do something that is counting on speed, this is your storage. So let's look at some of the use cases because these uh, can be interesting. I think one of them is cache uh, for invocation. So if you need to download bit files from S3, you download them in the cold start and then you can kind of verify if those files are there in uh, when the Lambda is warm and you can reutilize them. So you don't need to download those files every time, or you can do the same for dependencies or things that are big. 
Other use cases are processing big files, so you might need to do some video editing or um, PDF conversion or zipping files or audio filtering, whatever you need to do with big files. You sometimes need to download them to your machine in order to work with those libraries, so this is a good option. I have made a video out of this exclusively where I talk more about the use cases, so I left you that video in the description box so you can go and check it out. If you're liking this video, until now, there's two more storage solutions and please give it a like, why not? It's free, yay! <laughs> and if you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Every week there is new serverless content. So let's move to Amazon EFS. Amazon EFS, Elastic File System. This is not something that we hear a lot when we talk about Lambda because Amazon Elastic File System is more associated with instances. So it's a networking uh, Elastic File System that gets attached to your functions in this case, not only to your functions, but to your containers and to your EC2s. And you can share it around multiple applications, so functions and invocations, so that's quite nice. EFS also offers high availability, so you put something there and it stays there, so it doesn't get renewed with every invocation. So that's good. And the Lambda functions can change the content and the content can change dynamically and the Lambda functions will get that um, change. There is no files limit into EFS, but there is connections, concurrent connection limits. There is uh, 25,000 concurrent connections per file system. You may think that's a lot, but every invocation creates a new connection. And um, if there are other applications as well connected, well, that's a limitation that is there, but it's not a big one. For me, the biggest limitation is that you need to put your Lambda function behind a VPC in order for this connection to work because uh, EFS is usually, well, it's always <laughs> uh, behind a VPC and you need to put the Lambda function in there in order for them to talk to each other. The connection works um, very fast. It's like a, not as ephemeral storage, but almost because it's a networking hard drive. Basically, you need to mount this hard drive and then you can use the AWS SDK to perform all the operations and access the files with uh, operations in the file system. So that's good. I have a video on how to use it with CDK, so you can go and check it out. If you want one with some, just let me know. Let's talk about some examples of this. Um, I like this one that is uh, quite interesting because a lot of you uh, want to have dependencies that can change and you don't need to redeploy your functions. So this can be a good place to do that. Mount an EFS and then throw all your dependencies in there and then the Lambda functions will basically take them as you change them and that's good, no need to redeploy. But have in mind that if you change a dependency, the Lambda starts working with it. You need to make sure that everything is properly tested because this can drive for a lot of cows. So be careful. Also, uh, EFS is great if you need to work with files and, and you need to append the file to a file system or, or work with uh, different file systems. Also, sometimes you need to share packages that exceed the um, size of the female storage or the layers, so you can use uh, EFS to share that kind of very big files in a faster manner. Finally, the outlier, the ones that I'm pretty sure you don't imagine that is here, that is Lambda layers. When I talk about storage, I'm pretty sure that all of you can list three, but you might not have thought about Lambda layers. And you're right, it doesn't look like a storage solution, but it is. Lambda layers are a storage solution where you can package whatever you want and share it with your functions. Lambda layers are part of your deployment package, so they count as that. Uh, that's a limitation on your 50 uh, megabytes of zip information um, and cannot be changed without redeploying your function. So those are limitations of layers. Layers can be shared across multiple functions, but they are only read only. Yes, only read only. <laughs> uh, so nobody can change them. All layers come with a layer version, so that's great for keeping track of what uh, version your Lambda function is consuming of the layer, and you can have a really good auditing thing in place there, so you know exactly which versions and whatever is inside that package. 
One cool thing I really like from layers is that it can be shared across accounts. So you can consume layers from uh, trusted developers, it only has partners, providers, and all kinds of things. So that's amazing. You just use the Amazon resource name, the ARN of the layer, while they're in the same region and with the same uh, architecture, meaning Graviton2 or uh, x86, then you can use the layer and that's amazing. Accessing the data inside the layer is as fast as ephemeral storage because the content of the layer is part of the deployment package. So it gets deployed in the instance. So it's kind of like ephemeral storage. So that's good. So if you need to get data from there, it's amazing. And it also works like a file system, but it's read only. So you need to be aware of that. I have made a video talking all about layers and with a lot of information. So I leave you the link in the description box so you can go and check it out. There is uh, an example using infrastructure as code, building your own layers and also wrapping third party dependencies in your layer and talking why you should do one or the other and all those stuff. So some use cases for Lambda layers, dependency management. I love this use case. So you can have control or what dependencies are inside your function. You can share them across function. You can build these packages that are um, corporate wise. All we are always using these versions. And when you change the version, you need to redeploy the function and make a conscious effort on uh, changing the version. Also, it's good to share compile libraries. So sometimes you need to work with uh, particular libraries, like the uh, example that I share with the ephemeral storage that I'm using uh, FFMPG to edit video and process video. I put that in a layer. So that's um, a compile library that I compile in the architecture of the Lambda function. I upload it to a layer and I use it there. Also, Lambda extensions are usually uh, packaged in a layer. So in order to use extensions, you might need to bring your uh, layer to your function and they bring all the information and all the dependencies that those extensions need. If you want to know more about extensions, let me know in the comments. I have not made a video about it, but if it's something that people are interested in, I can make a whole uh, video talking about Lambda extensions. So to conclude, now you know the four ways that you have available to store things in Lambda. So we have uh, S3, typical, that's kind of where everybody starts, ephemeral storage, now up to 10 gigabytes. Now uh, we have EFS, uh, the file system, and Lambda layers. Each of them with different trade-offs, different complications and benefits. So when you're choosing the right strategy, you need to understand why uh, you need one over the other and why to pick one. So I hope this video helped you to take that decision. If it did, please let me know in the comments and share with me what use cases you have for the different storage solutions. I see you in another episode of Fubar. Ciao, ciao!